the 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 weather patterns here change dramatically and in this little town it's the most extreme weather we have on the volcano for uh, different reasons one it's on the sea two it looks east and since the volcano is very steep and there it's extremely steep 90 percent of the vineyards are terraced yeah. and as they as they uh, it's a different completely different soil because it, it comes from a, a caving in of the volcano you know tens of thousands of years ago mm -hmm. as a consequence that that soil does not drain and therefore the walls that are made there are different from the walls anywhere else because they have to withhold the weight of a soil that contains a lot of water mm -hmm. and that would knock down the walls if they were uh, impermeable if they were cemented yes. so because and because it rains so much and it's so cool and foggy you can't really make red wine the red grapes need heat to ripen, whereas white grapes need light. Mm -hmm. They don't need heat. If they needed heat, you wouldn't be able to make wine in Germany, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the way it is, right? So basically, uh, that town, you really can only make white wine. But the white wine, because of that extreme climate, is very, very interesting because you have very high acidities there which are wonderful for white wine. So yeah. you get very crisp, uh, steely, brilliant kind of white wine, and it ages beautifully as well. Wh which so I bought a big piece of prop, big, a hectare and a half. Uh, so it's not that big, but uh, for me it's big. Yeah. And it's big if you have to fix up all the walls, right? Because it was abandoned for 20 years. Yes. So now next week, as soon as it stops raining, because it's, it's due to have some rain, We'll finish planting there, but we'll only, we we weren't able to finish uh, planting the whole hectare and a half because there's still a lot of walls to get to get fixed. But we can't wait because if, uh, if uh, it'll be too late to plant. So anyway, it's 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 stunning because there you see the sunrise. Mm -hmm. You're facing the sea, and on a clear day you can see from Calabria across the strait into mainland Italy, all the way to Syracuse. Oh, wow. And it's a, it's a gorgeous uh, place, but, uh, and, and you know, so we're, until I get, I was there the day before yesterday, and until, and they were just sprouting, you know, the, the new plants, the ones that we had already planted were mm -hmm. just sprouting. And it's beautiful to see. But because it's so terraced, and in many places steep, there's no one single point in the property where you can see the whole property. So you have to do it by drone. Oh, wow. You see, uh, and, uh, and uh, although it's not gonna be completed, I would like to have it as much complete as possible, planted and sprouted when you see quite a bit of green so you can understand from a drone shot uh, the plantings. And the same is true of, the, of a property that I got on the south side. Mm -hmm. Uh, that one where I bought, you know, with very old vines, but I've added uh, another half a hectare or a little less than about an acre, which we've planted. And so there's a lot of new things happening, like the, the one that I, like the picture that I, that I sent you, right? Yeah, can, we, uh, can I pop that uh, up on the screen right now? Maybe you could talk to me a little bit about that. Because Was that where you were yesterday with the shepherd? Let, let the, um, no, no, I was on the south side where we planted this, with the place where I told you we just planted this small parcel, uh, yeah. less, than, less than an acre. Well, how, on, uh, how does that even work? Does someone just come up and let sheep onto your property? Or, like, you see, there's the, 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 the problem is, you know, you know, you might have seen old westerns, and the old westerns always had the, prop, the, the problem between the, you know, the cattle, uh, you know, the cattle owners that wanted, they didn't want fences, they wanted the land to be, they could take the cattle everywhere, and the landowners that didn't want the cattle there, they wanted to plant, you know, their crops, right? And there was, yes. and people would tear down the fence, it's a big thing. Okay, well, the same thing is in Italy. It's, it's always been that way, you know. The shepherds don't have their own land, usually, and if even if they do, once the, once the sheep have 
they're eating there, they need to eat somewhere else. Yes. Right? And, and the problem is that the Italian law allows if one sheep can crawl into a hole, the mm -hmm. whole you know, herd can go in there and they can't do absolutely anything. Mm -hmm. uh, so these people take advantage of it, of course. Nobody can fence in everything. And it's a big problem, when, particularly when, when the plants are budding, which is now. Because yes. the sheep will eat everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your crop is gone. Right? And they don't give a shit, frankly. <laughs> uh, so, you know, luckily somebody told me and I had to, you know, drive over there. And uh, I'm, I'm on the north side. This is on the south side. <clears throat> How far, I had to how call far drive is that? Yeah. Is that like an hour, hour and a half? Or? It's about a half. No, 45 minutes drive there. Mm -hmm. um, but again, that's, that's when I found out that if I call the police, unless I see somebody, the shepherd with the sheep, going, taking him, into, him taking the herd into the property, unless I have a visual of him and possibly a picture of him. Yes. I, I can't do anything. If I have the whole, uh, uh, the whole, um, uh, you know, whatever, hundred sheep in there and nobody's there except the sheep, yes. I can't do anything. And if I, and if I actually kill one of the sheep or shoot one of them, I can be, I can be uh, sued. Wow. It's, it's unbelievable. So anyway, that's, it's one of the many, you know, things you have to live with. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, so it's interesting yeah. growing fruit on Mount Etna. Then I'm, I'm sure more so than. Well, no, it's everywhere that was. It doesn't, it's not only on Etna. It's, it's all over Italy. Okay. And you know, this is the reason why you know you get your, for instance, we had dogs poisoned mm. oh, really? because what what happens? The, the shepherds come with the sheep sheep dogs. Yeah. And they don't want any other dogs fighting their sheep dogs. They don't want any kind of trouble. So before they come or they enter the property, if you have dogs, they'll just throw poisoned uh, uh, food to them. That is we had 12 dogs, 12 dogs uh, uh, poisoned since I've been here. Jesus, huh? Yeah. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a strange affair. But anyway, <laughs> now they don't, now, you know, I mean, this is, this is, was a, I hope the last time this happens, because if you do call the cops and the cops come, they tell you they can't do anything, but they tell you, you know, denounce the fact if the, it happens another time, then they'll take a different view. Yeah, yeah. You see, one time they can, they, you know, the, the shepherd can say, oh, you know, I lost them. I was somewhere else. If it happens twice, you know, it's a little tougher to, to do that. So I, I hope this is the last time it happens. Fingers crossed. Anyway. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so nothing much has changed here. We're locked down, but in, if you have property and if you have vineyards, you can move from one parcel to the other for obvious reasons because you have to work the vineyards, right? Yeah. So nothing here has changed much at all. We're working the vineyards. We've planted some and we have to finish, as I mentioned, planting um, because we had to plan all the planting long before. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for instance, we had to order um all the um, you know all the plants yeah yeah are to, to uh and, and this happened long before lockdown or long before anything after order the year before right so and then and then you know a lot of other things you have to well for instance we're bottling why because we ordered the we had to order the bottles the corks and all that stuff arrived and at a certain point you have to just get it out of the way so you bottle Yes. So we're bottling and we're bottling the white wine that I told you about, you know, the 2019 white wine. Yeah, I'm excited. Uh, at the rosé, uh, we've bottled some of the rosé and we've bottled the single video 2018s. Mm -hmm. And basically we ship them to port. We yeah. ship them to Livorno if they go overseas and we ship them to Verona if they go to Italy or to Europe. Um, and they stay there, they're all pre-ordered and they all, they're all labeled accordingly. And then eventually people will pick them up. Yeah, yeah. And when uh, they feel they can uh, work with them. Yeah, and how? So a lot. We were talking a little bit yesterday. I can't about, hear you. Sorry, we were talking a little bit yesterday about the demand. You got me now, or? Yeah, I'm, I'm just raising my volume. My yeah. volume was low. 
We, um, we talked a little bit about demand that you're seeing globally right now and a little bit of softness. You think that's going to continue or what, you know, what's your take on, on that? Oh, look, I mean, it's very difficult because it's very difficult to assess. Mm -hmm. We've shipped, uh, to, uh, uh, to various, uh, countries now. Um, we should, well, a little bit in Italy, mm -hmm. a little bit in Italy. We ship to Germany, um, to, we're about to ship to Denmark, Holland, Belgium, um, to Japan, yes. and uh, a few yeah. other places. Anyway, the, the point is that as, uh, you know, there are countries, I mean, we ship to over 70 countries, but there's over 200 countries that are on lockdown, you know, in one way or another, or total lockdown or partial lockdown. Yeah. For instance, Korea, we have to ship, we're shipping to Korea because they're, they've got the thing more or less under control, right? They've been one of the best. Uh, we've shipped to Taiwan because they are the best. Mm -hmm. They've had only, I think, six deaths and less than 400 um, cases. So there's, there's certain countries that are going to pull out of lockdown sooner than others. And it's very difficult to judge who's, you know, who's going to do this first, who's going to, you know, what policies the politicians will take. Uh, apparently, Germany is going to pull out pretty soon. And um, Switzerland is, is, uh, is pulling out slowly. So it's hard to say. I mean, uh, as I mentioned, we need to do about 40% of what we did last year, 35, 40% of what we did last year. That'll allow us um, to bear the, 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 the brunt and uh, that next year things should be quite a bit better. Yes. Um, but that's just because last year was, you know, our record year for sales and, and, uh, and uh, so we're living now um, until uh, we're living uh, on last year's profits. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, because we stopped cold on investments and stuff like that. We were supposed to buy a, a, a tractor and a press and a <coughs> very sophisticated filtering unit. Yes. A couple of other things. And, and uh, we just stopped that cold. And uh, so we'll see. Yeah, just play it by ear and see how it goes. I wanted to ask you, I, I haven't, I haven't, um, imported a lot of your single vineyard um, whites. Yep. I, have, I have the Santo Spirito in my fridge. It's probably a little bit too early for me to be pulling the cork on it. But <laughs> what do you, what, can you tell me about the Santo Spirito Bianco and um, what you think of it in comparison to your other single vineyards? And I don't know, give me a little look at it. <laughs> hey. This is my daughter, Elena. Yay. She's the computer gal. Thank you for getting them all set up on Zoom. Bravo, bravo, that's bellissima. Anyway, uh, the, yeah, look, the thing is about the Santo Spirito, as about the Calderada Sotana. Yes. Uh, the first vintage of both those wines, the whites, was 2014. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's when our uh, two vineyards that we had planted in those uh, area on whites. Uh, were about eight to ten years old, and therefore um, good. You know, they had strong. Uh, we had strong plants, and we could that could deliver wine uh, that could that deserved the name of a single vineyard. Yes. Uh, so I don't have a big track record. You know, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and now we're about to bottle the 19. So that's six vintages. Yeah. Um, Last year I did, a, uh, what I can tell you is last year I did a vertical tasting. Actually it was a surprise tasting because we were doing a tasting of reds with a Swiss importer uh, between Lausanne and Geneva, mm -hmm. an old friend. And we were doing this uh, big tasting of the reds of all the single vineyards and a couple of uh, back uh, vintages and this and that. And then 
uh, towards the end of the tasting, he said, hey, I've got, you know, five vintages of white, so, you know, and it was Santo Spirito, by the way. Yes. So, he's, I, so he said, shall we do it? And I said, let's, why not? Let's do it. And I, honestly, I had never done it myself, right? I, you know, every once in a while, I pop a bottle of this, I pop a you know, vintage of that, but I hadn't done them, you know, back to back, five vintages. And uh, I was, uh, I have to say, I was very proud because uh, they were all really excellent. And you couldn't really, I mean, I couldn't really choose a, a vintage over another vintage. Mm -hmm. Nor still now do I, I, I mean, do I know exactly how they will develop in time because I don't have, we don't have that, that many uh, vintages. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, Santo Spirito, however, if you want to know what I think of Santo Spirito specifically, because I, you know, I've done you know, six, seven, whatever vintages of both Santo Spirito and Calderada, and they're radically different. Mm -hmm. uh, Calderada, just like the Santo Spirito and Calderada Red, are radically different. Yeah, they are. So the Santo Spirito is a, a bit higher altitude than the Calderada, and it's more floral uh, as a terroir it seems to deliver both in the white and red a more floral uh, spring-like or summer-like um, uh, flavors and textures, whereas Calderada is richer and, and, and uh, wider, more ample, uh, more buttery. Uh, and uh, less, let's say it's more horizontal and less vertical in its, in its uh, uh, delivery, mm -hmm. right? So the, the Santo Spirito tends to have more uh, high tone freshness, and whereas uh, the Calderada tends to be warmer and, uh, and uh, richer. Uh, yeah, let's, yeah, let's say the Santo Spirito is more spring and the Calderada more summer. Uh, although the Calderada is, is changing uh, as, uh, as I think will change dramatically as we add the new vineyard that we planted, which is the highest vineyard in the whole Calderada crew. Mm -hmm. And it's the only white, white uh, grape vineyard, uh, Caricante vineyard in the, in the high end of, of uh, and it's, since it's a much cooler climate there, I think It'll it'll give an uplift to the Calderada, which will change its uh, its character a bit. Still has that very rich complexity, but it will also have a more uh, a more uh, lifting quality to it. Is that uh, is that from the yeah. young vines and from the higher altitude? So how big is that crew? For I I I don't think I've ever been to it. Um, like it, is it a, lar a large size? Uh, that, Calderara. Yeah. Well, it's not. It's 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 pretty big, yeah. but it's not as big as other ones. But uh, the the thing about it is that almost none of Calder, nothing of Calderara. We're the only ones that have white gra white uh, grapes in Calderara. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this vineyard that's coming into production, this vintage. I mean, this in 2020, we'll get our, our first harvest of the of the high elevation vineyard of Calderada. But I mean, you know, it's the first little grapes. They will not go into the crew, yes. for sure. They'll go into the, they'll go into the um, uh, Etna Bianco. Mm -hmm. we'll, ha we'll have to wait a couple of vintages before the, the, the plants are strong enough to deliver something that has the complexity that, that we'd like to put into a single vineyard. Um, so, yeah, so that's, uh, we'll have to wait a couple of years on that. But I can, I, I, I assure you that, I mean, that's the way, it's, unless I'm much mistaken, uh, I think that, that will change the, the character of the wine. And, you know, then I don't know if it's going to improve it or I, I, I suspect for my taste, it will improve it. Yes. But, um, but then, you know, it's somebody else may think the other one ha, ha, was you you make know, all your wants for your creamy. And uh, and finer. No. How do you go about doing yeah. that? Do you make your wines? No, no. I mean, sorry, you froze on me. I can't hear you. Yeah, I lost yeah. you for a second. Yeah. Are you back? You were saying? I just wondered, like your philosophy and your winemaking. You're making the wines for your. You're making the wines for your for your taste. I'm assuming, right? Like, 
I don't know. That's Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I mean, I make them for my taste. It's not only, it's, it's, uh, let's say that I'm making them for my culture. Okay. Because, because it, your, your culture determines, up to a certain point, it determines your, your taste. Mm -hmm. right? So if you, it's like if, it's the same in anything else. If you've been uh, raised on Shakespeare, you're going to like Shakespeare and his contempt, you know, you're going to love Marlowe, right? Or something like that. Mm -hmm. So the, sa the same thing in, in, in wine. I mean, if you have, if you've been, if you've never had, you know, much wine outside of your own small area, that will determine the way that you look upon things up to, you know, up to a certain point, not totally, but up to a certain point yes. but if you have a wide experience in wine that will change your outlook and um at a certain point you will have wines that are your favorite wines <laughs> you know and, and you know i mean the, the wine world is divided between obvious things right the half the population loves bordeaux the other half loves burgundy or i don't know if it's 50 50 but you know so uh, and and that's that's the way it goes. So if somebody loves Burgundy, he's going to tend to, you know, he's going to tend to, uh, you know, love elegance more than structure. Mm -hmm. In in general, he, he he'll have he'll try to make wines that are uh, where having their feet down deep in the soil is not as interesting as having your head up in the clouds. So. Uh, so I, I being a lover of, of, uh, the wines of the, of Piedmont, of the Barolos and Barbarescos and of Burgundy mm -hmm. is why I chose to come to the Etna in the first place, because just drinking the farmer's wines here, which when I happened to be here in, in the late nineties, I, I, you know, I thought this was the kind of wine that I would love to make. Yeah. I never thought that I would make it. Uh, this far, <laughs> nor that I would make wines this fine, because I think they, they really are uh, stunning, stunning wines of great elegance and depth and and gracefulness and everything like that. That you know, they're dancers. But um, but so that's where the direction goes. Culturally speaking, that's 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 where you know that's what I I like to feel. So you know. I, I like I, I I like to make vineyard wines. We we were the first to put in a, a single vineyard on a bottle in 2002. Yeah. That was my first wine, and it was Guardiola. When when you were there, did you see it when you when you first bought your vineyard bought your vineyards and decide to move to Etna? Could you see that there were that this was there were going to be crews that that there were going to be single vineyard bottlings, and that's the shape that you wanted your winery to take? I mean. Was it was it clear? Was it really clear? It was very clear because my first bottle had, had a vineyard on it. Okay, you know, <laughs> can't, can't be clearer than that. Yes. And for the first three years, the authorities sequestered my wines and gave me huge fines because for you know one of those mysterious bureaucratic reasons. Although the appellation regulations and the statutes allowed for. Uh, putting single vineyards or let's say uh, locally denominated wines, which is what a crew is mm -hmm. or a single vineyard. Um, there, there was a, a, a government, national government uh, decree in 2001 or something that required that uh, you couldn't put a name or vineyard name on your bottle of wine unless in the statute every single crew was dis uh, not described but at least the name of the crew had to be in there and since there's over like 200 or 250 here on that no, nobody when the statute was done in 1968 thought of naming all the goddamn crews into the statute right mm -hmm. so although although the statute you know said you can do it all of a sudden, the government said you couldn't, and so every year I would release. First year I released Guardiola, second year I released Guardiola and Calderara. Third year I did Guardiola, Calderara, Ferdo di Mezzo. Every three, every you know, finally, 
the anti-fraud uh, authorities, you know, kept kept you know coming over here, impounding the wines, giving me fines. Till finally they understood. I, 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 you know, we had long talks, and they finally understood that. I wasn't doing anything wrong, and that in fact, in doing this, I was helping them. Yes. Because if I said that in the Guardiola, I bottled, you know, whatever, 5,000 bottles, they knew that according to the property that I had, I couldn't bottle more than a certain amount, and so they could control it. And if they did it with it, if everybody else did that, it would make it a lot easier for everyone to yes. control any kind of fraudulent attitude. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, now everybody does that. Everybody puts single vineyards on their wines all over Etna. Uh, the difference it can be, unfortunately, uh, that I did it because I knew that there was a qualitative element that separated, not only a qualitative element in the sense of, uh, of a difference between what was grown in Guardiola and in another place, for instance, but that Guardiola was actually a higher level of quality. So mm -hmm. I put the single vineyards and bought the vineyards because I knew that they were going to be higher quality. Yes. And that's what has addressed everything that I've bought, all the vineyards that I've had, that I have, that I own, and that I've planted. Because loving Pe we, we were the first to do this in Piedmont in the 80s. Mm -hmm. Why? Again, the, you know, because of the Burgundy example, which was, you know, went back hundreds of years. But the point was, for me, it was extremely clear that if you have premier crews and grand crews, it may not be today, it may not be tomorrow, like, you won't get further up than village. You can make a fabulous village, but it'll never be a premier crew yes. or a grand crew. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, you know, every year, still now, in, in my cellar, I vinify over 50 different vinifications of different grapes on Etna, including all our vineyards, plus others that I source grapes from, yes. old vines, young vines, et cetera, et cetera. And this has allowed me now in 20 years to map out all of the northern part of the Etna millimetrically and know exactly where the finest vineyards are, where I can source fruit and where I can buy my vineyards or land where I can plant vineyards. Yes. So in fact, that has informed me from the very beginning and places Terenere now as probably the only estate on Etna which has ex only exceptional vineyards. Mm -hmm. 26 parcels of outstanding vineyards, historically uh, renowned uh, for their quality. So here's a question for you. What is, do you have a favorite vineyard or a favorite crew or a favorite bottling? Yes, I do, but I should, but I do. <laughs> You know what? The, the internet just um, just broke down on us at the perfect and time. <laughs> the reason it's Calderada Sotana. Sotana. Oh, huh? uh, I, I said Calderada Sotana. Calderada, yeah. Okay. And the reason for that is actually very simple because <coughs> this guy. There was a. Oh, there you go. Now, that's by the way. That's fa a fabulous, fabulous bottle. I fabulous bottle. But, the reason for that, when I bought my second property in Calderada, um, the property that, uh, that uh, allowed me to build a cellar, mm -hmm. and because the first two vintages, I, I didn't have a cellar, I had to uh, vinify in somebody else's cellar, and it was a huge pain in the ass. Um, so then I had to buy a place where I could build a cellar. And when I bought the place, I basically, uh, it came with two, it came with, and everyone is, his name was Don Beppino. He passed away four years ago. <laughs> but if you look on the pre phylloxera, yeah. yeah, it says the Vina di Don Beppino. On the label, it says, underneath pre it says the Vina di Don Beppino. Right. Yeah. Okay. 
Well, that's I, that. That is in honor of the man who cultivated that vineyard for seventy years and allowed us to have the prephylaxera vines in such great shape. He was born on the farm, and uh, he 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 was like a a positive virus on me. He contaminated me with his love of Calderada and uh, and it's never been able to i've never i've never come come out of that viral state <laughs> no I never, it was he, he was he loved this place so much and he took so much care with it and he described it so well and i mean uh and how, he how talked do you, so much. how do you describe it because for me it has so much personality that one i love it it's got a little bit of everything in it but I, i'm interested to hear how how he would describe that vineyard I remember Don Beppino described it once to me. He he said it was creamy, era cremoso, creamy, yeah. and and uh, that's that's part of it. There's a there's a delicate delicate richness in it that's extraordinary. Soil wise, it's the rockiest um, it's the rockiest uh, crew in, in in the whole of the Etna in uh, north east south. Uh, it's just all rocks. So it's 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 quite stunning to see the plants just shoot out of this you know this this bed of rocks mm -hmm. um, as as a, as a flavor uh, as a, it, as you know as a, Don Bepino says it has a texture a texture that that is that is wonderful because it's gentle and, and creamy and uh, and and yet it has a, and it has a, a grip that is, that's not tannic it's it's a grip that's it's, it's gentle it's like you being held in in the grip but by somebody who has gloves on you know mm -hmm. and it's it's a uh, and it's it it's not uh, you know if if i it's not it's never uh it's never even just wrapped off the skins uh, the first time it's never it's never fruity it's never floral it's always it has it that, that go back to the to uh, to autumn to to moss to wet leaves uh tobacco mm -hmm. um herbs spices um it's it's uh it's unique in in, the, in that way with respect to all other vineyards that i that i have uh, and it's a combination of this of this uh of this dark side, let's say, you know, this dark heart, and uh, 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 and and the, the 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 elegance and the gentility of the wine that make it so special. Yes, I, and then you know, there are other people, but you know, again, if you put ten people into a room and and, and try them on uh, on, you know, most of my single vineyards, what I've seen is that uh, by far the most friendly consumer friendly one the one that everybody loves is santa spirito yeah 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 santa spirito is absolutely the charmer right i mean it's sexy it's definitely feminine and sexy it's i mean it's like dress to kill uh it's it's just 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 a wonderful wonderful floral and beautiful uh wine in that way and but there you go so you know, then there's people that swear by Guardiola and so on. A lot of people that love San Lorenzo, which won, you know, great prizes, you know, couple, last year and all that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. So, you know, it's just a question of the thing that's important is that uh, more than anything else, I think, I think, is that they are all so different. And this variety really is the spice of life. I mean that's what's so beautiful about drinking Barolos or Burgundies, and because you know you eventually you know if you have a nicely stacked cellar, you'll never you never really say I want to drink a Burgundy. You'll say I want to drink a Chambol or I want to drink a Gevray or or feel like having a Pomar or a Volnay or this or that because there's a wine for every moment uh, and for every kind of uh, palate and sophistication. And uh, the same here. And what I've also seen, uh, and and this is extremely important, is that we're 
we always get the the wines get more clear and pure every year so they resemble each other much more every year the difference the guardiola is so precise now mm-hmm. its identity is so uh pure and clean and sharp and and obvious uh which means we're getting better in the vineyard which means that we were we're able to let that vineyard express itself and even in the cellar we're getting better because we're getting out of the way yeah. <laughs> we're being uh, less visible as a hand of a winemaker because if you know it, th- that's the whole thing it, i mean there's no point in 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 doing single vineyards unless you let the vineyard express itself if you have a big ego and you <laughs> as a winemaker <laughs> you shouldn't be doing single vineyards right because all you want to do is express yourself yeah with the oak or whatever you want to push yeah. it yes yeah it, so Marco, is it, is it cool if I share that picture of the vineyard so you could talk a little bit about that vineyard? Because just to give some perspective of what, um, what you're what working vineyard? with. The, the vineyard, the picture you sent me earlier today, Boca, Boca do Oro. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Cool. Let me Boca just... Dor, which means, by the, can you hear me? Yeah, I've got you. I can hear you. Okay, good. Boca Dorzo means, the, 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 means barley mouth. Barley mouth. <laughs> right, barley mouth. And... Uh, that um, I don't know. Can you see? Obviously, it? I mean, it's full of meaning. It's it's a very it's a very special area because it's a high altitude area, around seven hundred and fifty to eight hundred meters. Here we're at eight hundred meters where this vineyard is, but it's never steep. And usually, as you go, uh, you know, every mountain as you go higher up in the mountain, every mountain gets steeper. Right, it's a, it's a, it's just the way mountains are, right? Yes. So this place uh, had had a nice <clears throat> flat areas, and yet it was high altitude, so it had the freshness, and people could plant a lot and have quantity, and have they planted grain there, and they planted, you know, barley and everything like that, and they got quantity and quality. Um, unfortunately, here we we have quality, but we don't have quantity <laughs> because we made only three barrels. But that's the last, the last surviving piece because when the 1981 lava flow uh, annihilated the entire crew, uh, it formed because sometimes the lava comes down in waves and sometimes it finds resistance like water does as it comes down the mountains and it looks for the, for the easiest path. And sometimes uh, it'll come down in, in waves and sometimes in rivers. And here, the fingers formed of the lava, like formed an island. There's def- there's different little islands inside the crew, but most of them are just woods. Yes. And this is the only one that's cultivated. It's the only one that's left and that survived. And it's if you look at the picture now, and and you look at the at the bottom right side, you will see another vineyard on the other side of the lava. I see at the far far right side, kind of. There you go, far bottom right. Yes. That is another of our vineyards. That is the reason how I discovered that that vineyard because I was working in that vineyard on, on the bottom right, which is San Lorenzo, yeah. one of the other great vineyards, right? This and, is San Lorenzo. Yeah, that's that's yes, that's the San Lorenzo, our our uh, easternmost part of San Lorenzo and our highest part of San Lorenzo. And when I was working in the vineyard, I looked across the lava, and you see just before the vineyard. Uh, on the right side of the vineyard, on the bottom right side, you'll see a little house. Mm-hmm. And so I spotted that house, but I couldn't see the vineyard. So I spotted the house. I said, who would ever build a house in the middle of the lava? And so I walked o- over the lava, and, and I discovered the vineyard. And there were four people working it. There was four brothers that were the owners with the father. So I asked them if they would be interested in selling me the grapes. They said no. I said, would you be interested in selling me the vineyard? They said no. And, but they got my phone number, and uh, they said, if anything happens, you know, because we'd like to sell it, but the, our dad won't, you know, blah, blah, blah. So a year later, they called me. So I did four different contracts to buy less than an acre. And what, was it, what, was it four brothers? Yeah, four brothers. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, and in my opinion, that is the finest wine we've made in 2019, really? with the, the only exception of the pre mm -hmm. It is absolutely extraordinary. I mean, really, really great wine. I mean, I, it's, it's very, very special. You said three so, barrels you made only, huh? Yeah, three, yeah, three barrels. So it'll be about the equivalent of 900, roughly 900 bottles, but I think I'm gonna make some magnums too. Nice. <clears throat> so it's a great vintage and a, a great uh, vineyard. Um, actually, to be perfectly honest, I don't own the whole of that. Yeah. There's a, the upper part is owned by the uncle. Yes. Who sells me his grapes. And uh, hopefully this year after the harvest, he'll sell me, you know, the other, whatever it is, a half of an acre or a quarter of an acre that he has. Uh, but he he doesn't bottle the wine he just makes it for his own family i see yeah it's a beautiful vineyard and it really gives you perspective of of the terrain that you're working in yeah i mean beautiful absolutely absolutely it's a it's a it's a crazy crazy place isn't it <laughs> yeah to, to think that you had to write four different contracts to buy a tiny piece of land like that i mean yeah. it, it get complicated what were the Again, this is again. This makes it similar to Burgundy, where you know some some people make two barrels of wine, three barrels of wine, one barrel of wine. Yeah, it's the same thing in Piedmont. You know, it's all tiny little prop properties. Some producers in in uh, in um, in Burgundy or in Piedmont make five, six, seven different crews, ten, uh, and and the same thing here. The properties are very very small. Uh, they were small historically. This this was the only area of Sicily that not, that didn't have large feudal uh, properties. Yes. And uh, uh, in fact, interestingly enough, uh, if if you want to look into it, it's kind of interesting. Some of the most beautiful pages written on on Etna were written by a 22 year old Alexis de Tocqueville. Oh, really? Yep, <laughs> who wrote probably the best description of America ever written. And when he was 22, he, he wrote a diary of his travels to Italy. And he climbed on top of the Etna, all the way to the top of the Etna, and uh, described what he saw is the most beautiful description of Etna I think I've ever, I've ever seen. But he also was a you know, precocious <clears throat> sociologist. So he mentioned, you know, how different that whole area was socially and how the properties were, you know, divided and they didn't have the, you know, these, you know, huge <laughs> extensions and stuff like that. And he, he was curious about that already at that age. So that's kind of interesting as well. Yeah, it is. Because the, there's nothing, you see, there's no real book on Etna. I mean, somebody's just come out with a couple of things now, but they're not very interested. But historically speaking, you have to get bits and pieces <coughs> from dozens and dozens of other works, some, some of which uh, are just statistical and some of which uh, have to do with literature, but, you know, they were linked to the Etna because that's where it was written. Uh, there's a great author called Verga who wrote here and so on and so forth. Some of the, some of the stuff you, you just... Um, pick it up unknowingly and then it'll have a little something or other. Uh, the only serious historical uh, book we have was written by a Florentine in the uh, 18th century, a Florentine agronomist. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, uh, he, he worked here for three years and then finally delivered <clears throat> uh, what he uh, found here. He, he, wrote it down and, and then he delivered it in two conferences in the <clears throat> in an academy of florence very famous academy uh <clears throat> called l'accademia dei giorgofili of the lovers of the soil of the farmers let's say uh which was the landed nobility at the time the landed gentry um but then he delivered these two speeches which now are part of a tiny book which uh which is quite wonderful <clears throat> um, 
but then he got fed up where he said the people there were too snobbish and he left and, <laughs> and, he, and he started working in, in, in Istanbul for the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire at the time. <clears throat> anyway, a kind of a wacky guy. Sounds like it. <laughs> anyway, see, that's, that's the whole thing. You try to find out about things here for like the prices of grapes. I found this uh, diary or this book that was kept by one of the larger <clears throat> wine merchants in the Riposta area who shipped uh, from Sicily all over Europe. And he had a, uh, like, I, uh, I, I met one of his, uh, you know, grandsons <clears throat> who kept some stuff and he had a little book of the prices of the grapes in all the different single vineyards. Mm -hmm. And so then, you see, you knew, they knew perfectly well <clears throat> uh, where the good stuff came from. And, and that's still and, the way, it, it still is that way. Sure, I mean, I mean, no, no, it's not, it's not that way. Now grapes cost the same anywhere. Yeah. Or let's say that the north side is more expensive because the north side was always known to make the finest red grapes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and wine is, you know, for Italians, or, and I guess for the French as well, wine is basically red, right? And I mean, uh, it's true, it's that way. I don't know why it's that way, but it is that way, right? And so you only begin to see white grapes planted when the red wines are not as interesting. Yeah. Make red wine, you only find, when they make red, great reds, you only find reds, right? As, as the red wine is less interesting, you'll find some white. <clears throat> until finally you find only white because you can't plant red anymore. <laughs> so the further north you go, the more you'll find white, right? Mm -hmm. Makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. But, uh, well, I'll give you a, a, give you a little anecdote. Uh, in the late 80s, I went to, I was invited to a wonderful lecture that was given in, in, uh, by the Antinori family in Tuscany. I, being from Florence, you know, um, I was invited with a lot of other winemakers of the, of the, let's say, of the renaissance of Tuscan winemaking in the, in, the, in the 80s. Of course, there were all these uh, super Tuscans being made, right? Yeah, yeah. And so many people were using small French oak without having much experience. So the Antinaudi invited uh, this great um, French winemaker, very famous, Emile Penault. Uh, anybody who's made any kind of wine has his books in his library, you know, uh, tremendous, great, uh, a titanic figure of the 20th century winemaking. So he comes over and there's about 40 of us young uh, <laughs> winemakers and he gives, he gives a fantastic lecture and then he's, you know, the lecture ends and, and he, you know, he starts fielding questions and, you know, a lot of young people were asking all kinds of questions. So finally, this one guy, very nice guy, fairly shy, raises his hand and he says, you know, he says, thank you very much, Professor Peno. This has been an extraordinary lecture and, I, you know, I learned so much. But there's one thing that puzzles me uh, and I have to ask Uh, he, he said, you know, you, 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 you why, why is that? And a smile, you know, kind of formed on his face. And he said, dear sir, white wine, if it could, would be red. And <laughs> that was the end of the question. It was fantastic. It was one of the great answers and lectures I've ever heard. Uh, of course, he's from Bordeaux, so it's understandable that he would say something like that. But yeah, that's how a lot of people feel that way, let's say, right? Anyway, but we're making wonderful white wine uh, on Etna as well. And the north side is not the side, because precisely because it was the best side for making reds, people would make whites in other areas where the red, like that little town, Milo, where they could make red. Yeah. You see, or the neighboring towns around Milo, so Santa Venerina or Sant'Alfio, 
you'd have a lot more white grapes because the weather was such that the reds were not very good. Yes. Therefore, uh, but I was here on the north side, so I, so you I decided, okay, I'll plant, I'll plant some white here and see what happens. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Santo Spirito and Calderada are north side whites. And, and they're good. wonderful. Yeah, yeah. And they're wonderfully different one from the other. And, <clears throat> and uh, I don't know if you tasted, we have a white from Milo as well called just Bianco Superiore. We didn't put in a single vineyard because we were waiting for our grapes to, to put in the single vineyard. But it's a spectacular wine. Very, very different from Santo Spirito and Calderada again. Uh, it's just called Etna Bianco Superiore. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we have also, this year we'll release a white single vineyard from the south side at extremely high altitude. I bought a vineyard from which I was buying grapes after six years, it came for sale, and I bought it. It's tiny, so we're only making three thousand, I think, or three thousand or three thousand five hundred bottles of white wine from there. And uh, what is it called? Uh, it's going to be called Montalto, which means high mountain, Monte Alto. Oh. Um, and it is very high. It's 950 meters above sea level. So it's the highest vineyard we own. Mm -hmm. But being on the south side, um, you get a lot more sun. And as a consequence, you have to go high to get finesse. And so that's why that vineyard for me is so wonderful. It has an extraordinary exposure, full south. I mean, beautiful breezes. Uh, so it doesn't uh, suffer from mildew or iridium or anything like that. It's extremely healthy mm -hmm. and very high. So the temperature excursions are, are extreme as well. So you get this wonderful acidity that for the whites is beautiful. At the same time, a sweetness that the northern side, uh, the north side whites don't have. It has a, uh, you know, kind of a, it's, I don't know, it's a, it has a teenage feel to it, you know? It's yeah. kind of baby fat, I'd I'm, say. I'm, I'm excited to try that. What, what is your plan for the next 10 years of um, Terranere? Is it going to be growth, more purchases of property? Are you going to hone in on what, are you, on what you're doing? Or what, what, what's your game plan for the next 10? No, nothing, nothing else. I'm not going to, I'm not, I've, I've bought what I've wanted to buy. Uh, there's still about 10 hectares that have to come into production. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically what had happened is that we grew so, so quickly and so well and qualitatively as, as well that uh, we had, uh, we, we still had, we still, still, you know, buy grapes from our neighbors and this and that. And so uh, I don't want to grow in quantity. I just want to have more of my grapes and less of the grapes that I buy. So Mm -hmm. uh, as as we grow with our grapes from our own vineyards, we'll just buy less grapes, and yes. it'll all balance out. In about five years, we'll be where we want to be. So, of course, if a tiny little vineyard comes for sale that's adjacent to one of mine, you, uh, you know, I'll try. I'll try to. I'll try to get it. But yeah. that just you know, that will make a significant. It's like. The Boca d'Orzo that I just showed you, I mean, three barrels, that's not going to, that doesn't have an economic, uh, you know, uh, value at all. I mean, it, but it's it, irresistible when you know that historically that's been one of the best vineyards of all the northern side of the Vietnam. Yes. And uh, uh, I had, to, I had, if, if it were possible, I had to, I would have to, I couldn't resist getting it. Said, so nobody else can have it. Plus, it's a monopole. Plus, you know, the fact is that um, uh, <laughs> it's, it's how exciting can it be? You find the last, the last piece of a historically famed Grand Cru. I mean, it's irresistible. Right? Yeah. And I don't think well, there's a lot of these that's uh, that a lot more available of these kind of little miracles. Yes, yes. Right. <clears throat> so basically, I'm, I'm, I'm all set. How, how are you going to allocate that? I mean, if you, 
<laughs> I, we got to get some bottles for Bermuda. <laughs> I, I get, I get, a, I get a big fat allocation yeah. myself, and then, <laughs> and then it's just you know, I mean, it's just a couple of cases here and there for for friends and stuff. I mean, if you get a couple of cases, you're going to have to put away a case for yourself. You know, it's just, it's just, it's just not. There's, not going to be much going around. No, no, no. I wouldn't. Yeah, I. I mean, it's it's amazing. I have one another question for you. Uh, your olive oil. I love purchasing that every year, and everybody loves to to um to use it. Uh, do you have any coming out this year, or is it um or is it gone? Uh, I think I well, love. It still has to be harvested. Yeah. I mean, we harvest it after we finish harvesting the grapes. Yeah, yeah. But we release it usually in in uh in uh, february so the one from last year is long gone long gone yes yeah well because what happened uh, among other things is the year before it was a washout uh vintage for olive oil here this year was a washout for most of italy but mm -hmm. luckily we had a, a you know relatively large uh harvest and and so because nobody else did have it everybody jumped on it uh this year i don't know what's going to be the production because it hasn't even flowered yet yeah yeah Got to wait. plus even when it fl when it flowers even even when it looks really good it's very difficult to assess because um the flowering of the olive trees is magnificent and incredibly plentiful but only two percent of the flowers turn into olives yeah so it's very difficult to assess. But if you want it, uh, all you got to do is tell me and I'll set some away for you. Yeah, I love it. Every, I, anytime yeah. you have some, we're happy. I, I love I, one of my I favorite. Know, but I, I mean, <laughs> again, this is another thing. We, we, we get a big chunk. <clears throat> we go through a, a liter a week. Yeah. yeah. So anyway. Uh, definitely. Olive oil. You see, it's, it's not only you have to it's not, on, not only the olive oil. Next time I'll send you a picture. I'll send you a picture of uh, uh, my vegetable garden. Is it serious, huh? Okay. Because nothing here, I mean, everything here, the oil distinguishes not only the wine and the olive oil. Mm -hmm. They distinguish the, the oregano from here, from the oregano across the, the Alcantara River where it's no longer volcanic. Yes. So Everything here is more delicate and more refined. And, you know, wine comes from, from fruit, from grapes. Mm -hmm. So but the pears from here, the apples from here, everything from here is more fragrant and more delicate and more refined than anything on the white soils, as they call them, <coughs> or they call them the strong soils, mm -hmm. because they, they produce things that are stronger flavored but more vulgar. Yeah. So everything here that grows here, even the wild herbs that you eat here, the wild vegetables that, you, that are edible are wonderfully delicate. So it's just a volcanic area and the high altitude that keeps everything that grows here wonderful. The tomatoes are exceptional. And any kind of vegetables we plant. We've just planted over 2,000 plants between tomatoes, hot peppers, sweet peppers, Eggplants. So you, um, so you know, you know, got, I yeah. got to see a picture of this garden. It must be gigantic, huh? Yeah, it's, it's well, it's it's a quarter of a quarter of an acre. A quarter of an acre. It's pretty big. It's yeah, yeah, pretty yeah. Big. That's gonna keep and, busy, and, man. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, we 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 jar our own tomatoes. We make four hundred jars of tomatoes for for the whole farm, yeah. for uh, us and the other people that live on the farm and stuff. Yeah. And uh, uh, even the chicken lay a shitload of eggs. <laughs> it's unbelievable. So I've got a fridge full of eggs. We have to do everything. We have cakes and stuff in the morning. <laughs> we have to do everything. Frittatas, uh, that's weird thing, huh? Yeah, this is, it's, it's, a, it's a farm. It it's sounds like a good place to be locked down. So yeah. uh, I got to come yeah. back and visit sometime soon. Absolutely. I mean, we've just finished making a beautiful tasting room. Yeah. Beautiful tasting room. Nice. It's, and uh, and now, of course, it's locked down, so we don't have any visits. <laughs> so we don't use the tasting room. But when <laughs> it'll be in use, it'll yeah. be fun. 
by, by next by next summer, yeah, I, I'm sure things. Well, fingers crossed, everything's back to normal. Tourism Absolutely. is back and kicking. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Marco, thank you for your time. I really appreciate you explaining and, and chatting. I can't wait to come visit you soon. Hopefully. Absolutely. If we're out of chat any other time, just let me know because this was actually easy, even for you know. A, uh, uh, absolutely low class technician, uh, uh, you know. I no, mean, it's so really fun, right? Uh, yeah. it's well, this, I, I have another one tomorrow. This is like practice. Tomorrow I have one with my uh, Sicilian agents. Oh, nice. They decided I needed to do something like this. Uh, <coughs> and then, oh, you know, I have one uh, for those guys in the States. I forget the. Piccoloni uh, or maybe Venice. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Venice. I have to do that stuff. And so this is this is good. You know? yeah, it's awesome and um it's so easy to share pictures too i had no idea so that'll that's another aspect that would be fun if you ever get that guy with the drone to go over all your vineyards and take pictures of them i think that would be brilliant you know in, in a month a month and a half time i'll start him working on on some of my vineyards yeah. he's a very very good friend and, and actually it's not him it's his son as because of course the sons are always higher tech than the dads the son is the guy who flies the stuff the dad builds them Oh, that's cool. The dad, the dad builds them for uh, uh, very high, 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 high quality. They're huge drones. They're for the army and for the navy. He actually has one that he built one that goes underwater. Oh wow! Uh, yeah, but his son is the guy who drives them. So um, I'll have his son come on over uh, when you know when if it's not locked down. As soon as the lockdown ends and and the and the vineyards you know grow leaves and stuff like that, yeah. I'll, I'll have him uh, do you know like maybe. 10 at a time or something like that, or five at a time, and I'll send you pictures. That's awesome. I, I appreciate it. I'd love to see them. Yeah, absolutely. But then you have to come. Yeah. Which is even soon. Better. soon, soon, soon. I can't wait. Die. Marco, thank, care, you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Ciao, ciao. Bye.